So welcome everyone to what I wish I knew before going on call. I am Chie, uh, that's Wen Ting. She's also gonna be conducting the workshop. So we are software engineers at Yelp. So for those who don't know what Yelp is, Yelp connects people with great local businesses and we build tools for that. So that might look familiar to some people. And Wen Ting and I are from the advertisement team at Yelp which means that we build platform and data pipeline that are responsible for delivering ads, uh, creating analytics, and building advertisers. So first, I wanted to talk about why we're here. Technically, our title is not SRE, so what are we even doing at SRECon, right? Um, but we have some motivation that made us come up with this talk. So first, um, we're as team. And we are the on-call for our system. And ad is actually most of the Yelp's revenue. So when things break, the company's revenue is at stake. So on-call is very important for us. And, but we are software engineers, which means we wear many hats. Most of the time, we're not on-call. Uh, we are developing future new type of ads, or we're working on the infra side of the team. And Yelp, as the Yelp as a company grows, the system becomes more complicated and sophisticated. Um, which means that we started being on call for the system that, are, that consists of different tech stacks and then that maybe consists of many services. So that makes on call a little bit more challenging as well. And moreover, we have many new grad hires uh, on our team who will be on call eventually and we were like that too. And this makes onboard, good onboarding process even more important problem to solve for us. So this is why we've been thinking about this problem for a little while. We're by no means no expert, but we made some improvement to our organization, our team's on onboarding process, so we'd like to share that. So our story, Wen Ting and I both joined the team as new grad hires about four years ago, and absolutely not knowing anything about on-call. And we learned how to be on-call the hard way. Um, and now we're in the position of mentoring other engineers. So, how do we struggle when we are new engineers? <laughs> like that. <laughs> so first, um, we didn't have any established training process at all. If anything, right before we were about to go on call, there were some ad hoc training that were not very well executed. And also, there were some run books and documentation, but they were decentralized and outdated, which means that when I want to find an operational run book, I couldn't reliably find in a single location. And when I found one, there was no guarantee that the information was correct. So that was a challenge. And the first two points combined with the fact that the fact that the on-call means so much financial implication and pressure, it was very overwhelming and scary to a new engineer about to go on-call. Okay, so I'm also asking the same question to you all, uh, which I will show the result later. But I asked the same question to Yelp engineers. Did you feel ready before going on-call for the first time? And this was the answer. So about two-thirds of the people said no. And we also asked why. And these were the top five reasons. So from the top, they were afraid of unknown situations, lack of confidence, poor understanding of systems, lack of protocols, afraid of asking for help. Maybe some of them are familiar to you. Yeah, so you see that the word afraid popping up multiple times. There's also lack of confidence. It seems like this is something that we should address as part of onboarding. So maybe you're sitting here and maybe you're already expert of SRE, like why do you care about good onboarding, right? Or maybe you're sitting here because you care about good onboarding, so maybe I don't need to convince you. But it's important to make that clarify. So the first win is that it makes your team scalable. If you have an efficient onboarding, that means you have a new person joining and then you can make that person productive as an on-call engineer sooner. And if you're in the industry, it's the nature of the industry that people come and go to some extent. So if you have that trait in your team, that's a huge advantage to your team. And second, having a good onboarding means that you have to standardize some things like how to communicate, 
which tools you use or how to respond incidents, which means that if you have a good onboarding, you improve this incident response and you also make the incident response quality more consistent regardless of who's the on-call person that week. And third, teaching is the best way to learn. So that's kind of what I, what I found when I was doing this myself. Um, usually when I do my day-to-day -day work, it's very narrow and in-depth. But when I need to teach something, you sort of step back, look at the matter from a different perspective than you normally don't. And sometimes you find some facts that you used to neglect. So it's a very beneficial thing, even if you are a senior software engineer. And last but not least, confident new hires. So in the previous slide, we saw that a lot of people are afraid of going on call, but with good onboarding, we can solve that problem. And we might even have new engineers be excited going on call. So we'll get to that. So this workshop's goal is to build an efficient on-call onboarding system for your organization. So we'll do some exercise which you will be applying whatever we are going through to your organization's use case. So how do we do that? So here's the agenda for today. First, we'll go over a common myth about on-call. So we need, we, if we want to teach something to someone, you need to put yourself into the shoes of your students. So that's what we're going to do. There are some common myths that new engineers tend to believe in that are preventing them from being productive as an on-call engineer. So that's what we're going to go over. Second, we'll go over how to create training program. And here we'll go over a guided exercise step by step to create an actual training program. And then last, we'd like to go over run books. And run books are something that are actually commonly neglected, but it directly affects the productivity on, on call. So we'd like to share our experience of struggles as well as the improvements that we made um, that might be worth sharing. Yeah. Okay, let's get started. Four common myths about on call. The first myth is to think that I need to know everything about every system before going on call, otherwise I am not ready. But who knows everything about their company's system? Oh, I see some hands. <laughs> nice. <laughs> okay, well, me neither. Okay, so here are a bunch of smart engineers, senior engineers sitting here, and nobody knows everything. However, new engineers, when they come in, somehow tend to think that they need to know everything before they go on call, and that's simply not true. So it's important to emphasize the fact that you don't need to know everything. You do need to know something, though, which you should cover in your onboarding. And myth two is I need to solve everything by myself. If there's an incident, I need to debug everything end to end all by myself. Um, this is also not true. If you have been in the firefighting situation, even the actual firefighting situation, um, people work together, collaborate to put on a fire. And same with engineering. And if you are the on-call or investigator, you might be coordinating something, you might use some of your knowledge, but you don't know any, everything. So you are supposed to ask for help. You're supposed to communicate. Um, this is a teamwork, so you should emphasize that fact. And miss three, I need to find the root cause. So this is a tricky one. Um, yeah, root cause can be another topic on its own, but um, it's a pretty common thoughts that new engineers tend to have that I need to find the root cause. And it's actually natural if you think about it. If you are just graduated from college, all you did in your college assignment was to find a root cause, find a bug, and then maybe get an A or B. Um, <laughs> but that's not the case when you are on call and responding to incidents, right? Um, and actually, root cause is a non-goal of the incident response. And you have to make that clear because if you put someone new on the on call, including myself, um, the natural instinct is to like try to find what's wrong, what's the root cause, what's causing it, where's the bug. 
Um, and that can eat a lot of time. It can make the incident response very slow. And you may never find the root cause because sometimes things can happen with a combination of different factors. So it's a dangerous rabbit hole to fall into. And similarly, someone may say that I need to make the best slash long-term fix as part of the incident response. But again, this is not true. You're just supposed to stop the bleeding, turn off the fire. Um, especially this is true if you are paged outside of the working hour. So Wenti and I, unfortunately, we tend to get paged around 2 AM, which is not the best time for the brain. Um, However, we still need to fix the issue, and you probably don't want to be making some non-trivial code change, write tests, do some tests, and then deploy the code, which means you also need to go through some potentially code reviews. And that's a pretty risky change to go through um, at 2 AM, or in an emergency situation, you might make another mistake along the way. So when you're responding to incidents, you're supposed to mitigate the issue as soon as possible in a safer manner. So these are the four myths, and these might be probably obvious to you, but it's not obvious to someone new in your team. So when you are the person who are writing the onboarding, these are something that you need to be aware of and act actively demystify. So setting the right expectation is important because it will reduce fear. And these fear are unnecessary fears because they're based on the wrong assumptions. And also, if you debunk this myth, it will make the on-call engineers more productive and efficient. So set the right expectation during training. OK, now on to the actual training program. So let me give you the on-call training that I went through so you can get some more insight into what happens during a training. So there are four parts to it. Not every of the red um, trainings were designed to be for on-call, but here goes. So the first one is called As Academy, and it was eight hour long lecture series in one day. And yes. Um, <laughs> So it was basically a deep dive into every ad subsystem by different engineers who are expert on the subsystems. But it was a deep dive into each component of the system on your first week. And it was eight hours, so that's something to note. And second, so after a little while, I went through this on-point rotation where you are, you're the on-point of the ads team, meaning you answer the question about ads, from other teams, or you take on some uh, bugs or tickets that are not urgent. And then third, when my manager wanted me to go on call, I went through this on-call intro, everything you need to know about as on call, two hours. <laughs> and, then, and then I went through a round of shadowing where I get paged at the same time as a real on call and watch the person debug. And I joined on call rotation, and I've been on call for more than three years. OK, so let's analyze it. What was good about my training? <laughs> it existed. So I did the survey a couple times, and I found that actually a lot of the times on call training don't exist. So this was actually a good thing, um, and I appreciate it. Um, and the second thing I want to call out is on-point rotation. So this wasn't really meant to be for on-call training. It was more of a team's need that you need an on-point person. But it ended up being a very useful ramp up for me for on-call because you get to gain the breadth of the knowledge. In your day-to-day -day work, you gain the depth of knowledge. But for on-call, you need a breadth of knowledge. And shadowing was also helpful. One is because it's real you get to see all the tools and debugging action. But two, again, we get paged at 2 AM. You never know what it's like to be paged at 2 AM and having to debug until you experience it. And so it's nice to have that experience beforehand before I actually have to be solo doing it on call. So what was difficult about my training? First, as you saw in the diagram, it was a lot of information dump. 
and it was a little bit hard to absorb and also hard to retain the information because it just was too much. And also, a lot of the lectures I got was deep dives, but it didn't really emphasize on how those different systems are connected, which is very critical when you are on call and trying to estimate impact or trying to communicate with people. Also, it did not emphasize the investigation tools that are necessary. This is something that you either know it or you don't. It doesn't really have anything to do with how smart an engineer is. So a lot of engineers, though, had to figure out themselves like over time, which was very inefficient. So I wish the, there was a training which told us about this. OK, so based on that, when you are, are designing a training program, these should be the goal, outcome of the training. So when students get, come out of your training program, they should be able to draw a mental picture of your system and how they're connected. And they need to be able to understand failure modes and alerts for the system. And last, they should know the tools for investigation. OK, so let's now do an actual exercise. Here's an agenda. First, we'll make a structured curriculum. It's like back to school, except now you're the teacher. And second, you'll create an introduction for your system. And third, you'll actually cover the failure modes, which is the meat of your training program. And last, you'll list necessary tools. And what you're going to need is a text editor of your choice. It can be anything. It can be pen and paper. We might draw some diagrams, so pen and paper will be helpful, but it's not necessary. OK, let's get started. Making a curriculum. So when you make a curriculum, you're essentially designing a student's learning experience. So here's an anti-example, which is my training. <laughs> so yeah, so everything you need to know about on call, two hours, and that's it. So when you do this, students are not very happy or not very conscious. <laughs> So the tip here is to avoid information overload. It's very easy, though, to organize a training session that end up being a information overload because it's just logistically easy. So that makes sense. But also, you're not really getting the return on investment because people forget like 80% of the things. Um, so here's, here's a revised version of Onco training program. So first. I'll talk about on-call expectation, where I can probably cover the four myth, and as well as overview of ad system. And second, or from lesson two to five, I'll cover different subsystem of the ads, sorted by how critical they are. So that was my initial stab at it. And then you want to ask yourself a question: Is there information overload happening anywhere? So. If you look at the first one, the overview of the ad system, if you execute it wrong, it could also be an information overload. So this should be a very, very high level. And second, let's assume that the billing pipeline is a very complicated system with many alerts. So this could be also uh, information overload on its own as well. So let's split that up. So I take out a subsystem inside a billing pipeline into its own lecture called Ad Analytics Pipeline. And another question you can ask is, does the order of the topic make sense? So well, first, we have the overview of the assets in the beginning instead of at the end, so that's good. But another thing we can say is ad delivery. So if you think about ad delivery, when the user request comes, ad gets delivered to users, ad gets shown, and then generates clicks or views. So ad delivery is really the first step of the ad's life cycle and happens before usage or billing. So maybe it makes sense to put that before analytics and billing so that when the students are now talking about analytics, they know what the inputs are. OK, so here's the actual exercise. Um, 
will take about two, three minutes, but if you need more time, we'll extend it. Uh, so the first step, come up with a list of topics for your team, organization, chunk it into a reasonable size, and sort them. And if you are sitting with someone from your organization, feel free to collaborate. We don't have to stay quiet. And Wenti and I will go around if you have any questions. Sounds good? OK, I'll start the timer. Oh, sorry. Is everyone good? Who needs more time? OK. Cool. So hopefully, by now, people have a rough draft of your curriculum. So we'll get to the next exercise. 
So the next exercise is to create an introduction for your system. So here we want to take a step back and zoom out and look at our system and only talk about the key information that are necessary to understand the on-call training. So I'd like to call it 10,000 feet overview of the system because that's how much you want to zoom out. So why give an overview in on-call training? So this lets you make sure that the students are all on the same page. When you are, whenever you are running a training program, usually students come at a different level of understanding of the topics. So this lets you basically um, make the knowledge level the same. And also you can establish the vocabulary that you're gonna use later in your own core training system. And also this can provide opportunity for them to ask some basic questions about the system, which is nice. And the second reason is that it makes the fa failure points clearer. So if I say that for this system, these are the inputs, this is the data processing pipeline, these are the outputs, and these are the data loader. Um, without me saying what the system does, you can sort of tell what are the potential failure points are. So this is basically the function of 10,000 feet overview. It makes the training content later easier to absorb. So what should this include? A simple diagram. Diagram always helps for this kind of things. And a summary of the system. So this can depend on what you want to cover in the on-call training part, but usually what it does, what it depends on, maybe some tech stack. So let's look at an example. So I'll pick one of the topic here, Ad Analytics Pipeline, and I'll give you a short lesson about Ad Analytics Pipeline. So what is Ad Analytics? But basically, as generates clicks and views during the day. And this pipeline's job is to compute a daily usage analytics for each campaign that's running. So when I say analytics usage, it means number of clicks, number of views, and how much is spent. So it's very simple. So it takes the two logs, add view logs and add click log as an input and process them. And this is a MapReduce job, and it aggregates the data and eventually dump the data into data store, and in this case, it's Cassandra. And there are two systems that depends on it. One's billing pipeline to create charges to customers, and another one is targeting system to do some machine learning to make the future ad quality better. So that was simple enough. And a tip here I'd like to call out here is to use a visual aid you can reuse and refer to later in your own call training system. So for example, if I want to talk about failure that happens in the data loading, I say, okay, here, back to this diagram again, we're going to talk about alerts here. Or Cassandra cluster is down, what happens? So this way, people can map it back to the same picture over and over. So this way, easier to retain the information. Okay, so let's write a 10,000 feet overview of the system. So Probably you have a lot of topics, so you want to pick one topic from the curriculum and summarize the system, tech stack, failure points, etc., and add a diagram. Okay, we'll take another three minutes. Clock starting now.
So if you have a diagram ready, feel and if you have a Twitter account, feel free to tweet your diagram onto hashtag SRECon, and we can maybe look at the feed later. everyone doing? Good? Still discussing. Okay, let's get to the next part of the exercise. So hopefully now you have a nice 10,000 feet overview of your system. So next thing you wanna do is to write the actual on-core training part, cover failure modes. So this is the part that we're doing now. So usually it talks about what are the failure modes, what are the alerts, and how you should be responding to them. But that's a little bit of information overload and if someone is not familiar with them, it might be a little bit hard to map the information. So the tip here is to use a real past incident. And why use real past incidents? The first reason is examples are the best teachers. Usually people learn a lot better as soon as you provide them one example. So I recommend you do that to like any of your presentation, not just on code training. But, um, and also, if you have a past incident, you can create an opportunity to make it interactive. So let's uh, take another example here. So there, was, there is one alert called Ad analytics data processing failure, which maps to here. So the map reduce fails for some reason. And then the past incident that I came up with are some bad input schema change and map reduced task timeouts, probably due to some large data. So the exercise three is pretty simple here. Um, so for the topic that you chose, you want to list alerts and failure modes. If you, don't have, if you don't know the exact alert name, that's OK. You can try your best to know what the failure modes are. And don't forget to map it in your 10,000 feet diagram and find at least one past incident for the each alert. Okay, another th three minutes. Clock starting now.
Okay, how is everyone doing? Good? Cool. All right, so let's move on to the next part. So we only cover partially, so I'd encourage you to take this home and complete the rest of the section, the topics um, in your organization, but let's move forward. So last, we want to list necessary tools. Again, tools are something that's know-how, it's either you know it or you don't, so you want to teach them in advance. For example, look at this. This is one of our service dashboard, and it looks very scary. So, but at the same time, this helped us uh, debug a lot of incidents, and it was very useful. So if you don't know what you're looking, it is just overwhelming, but if you know, then it's very useful. So that's what you want to do in your training. So the example here is how to read the service signal effect dashboard. Um, ideally, this should be in Runbook, which, should be cover which will be covered later. But now we're designing an onboarding program. So the tip here is to let the student apply knowledge as soon as possible you teach them. So how do you do that? So I'll explain what the signal effect dashboard does, what are each of the charts mean. And you can use the past incident that you came up with and show an actual screenshot of a dashboard from there and let students debug and ask questions what happened. So here's the dashboard. And maybe what if one of the charts go down like this? What might have gone wrong and what might be impacted? So this will actually let them directly apply the knowledge that they just learned. So the last exercise here, list tools and know-how for the system that you chose based on your answers from exercise three, and think of a way to make it interactive. Okay, another three minutes.
Good. OK. So congratulations. Now you have a partially complete on-call training program. Yay. <laughs> So again, I'll strongly encourage you to take this home or back to your organization, not to home. Um, and ask for feedback for your teammates because it really depends on your team's needs and you to actually execute this training program whenever you have a new hire or whenever you have the need of training. Just to recap the tips, so these are the four tips that are covered. First, avoid information overload as much as you can and use visual aid you can reuse later. Use real past incidents as an example and let students apply knowledge. Okay, that's it for my part and I'll pass it over to Wenting. Hello everyone. Um, my name is Wen Ting. I'm also a software engineer at Yelp in Ads Team, same as Jia. So in the next about 30 to 40 minutes, I'm going to talk about what else we can do to prepare our new on-call engineers beyond the training program you just created. And first, I'm going to talk about how we can share knowledge with them, help them to get exposed to more incidents happening in the past. and help them to gain more experience before they're going on call. And the second part is going to be focused on the run books, um, how we can use and improve. And we're going to share a template that we're using in our teams. Hopefully, it's, um, you can reuse it or tweak it, maybe. Um, OK, let's start it. So how we can share knowledge with new on-call engineers? So in our team, we think there are three pretty good ways to share incident-related knowledge with new on-call engineers. So the first one is on-call handoff meeting. You probably already had that in your organization too. So usually it's a team meeting that happened during the two on-call shift. So what we discuss in this meeting. So usually we discuss what are some major incidents happened in the last shift and what are some follow-up ticket or follow-up tasks we want to do in the next shift why this is good. So usually we will invite our new on-call engineers or maybe the engineers who are already in the on-call training program to attend this meeting. So this is a great place for them to ask questions. And also it's a great place for senior engineers to show them how a particular type of incidents is triaged and resolved recently. So they'll get exposed to the recent incidents that happened during our, like in our team. And the second one, uh, we think it's pretty useful is post-mortem, or some organization call it post-incident review. It is a process you usually run after an incident, and they usually ended up with the documentations that record everything you found for the incident, like what happened exactly, what system normally work, and uh, what you want to do next. So this is a great place because most more than usually contains a lot of information. It contains a lot of details. So new engineers can learn a lot from that. For example, they can know, learn some very explicit knowledge, like what system usually works or how they normally work, or uh, what is the tools I can use to debug a certain system in our team. And they can also learn some very implicit knowledge, like what is the best time to escalate? What is the best time to communicate? Who is the go-to person for a cert certain area in your team, in your system? So Gia already mentioned that you can probably use the past instance to create your training program. I strongly encourage to give some few links there about the post-mortem happen. And for some post-mortem, it involves like many system, right? It doesn't fit into any particular topic you choose for your curriculum. So in that case, you can probably add a session after the training, uh, in the training program to encourage to read that post-mortem and maybe share their thoughts about it. The last one we think is pretty effective and efficient is called War Game. So, it is a pretty fast and safe way for new on-call engineers to relieve the incidents and gain more experience from that. For the next few slides, I'm going to talk about what exactly is a war game and how you can start your own war games from scratch. So what is a war game? Uh, it's a great gift, by the way. <laughs> uh, 
So if you play Dungeon and Dragon before, it's pretty similar to that. Oops. So War Game is a multi-person incident simulation game where the main purpose here is to simulate the incident scenario in a safe way so that new on-call engineers or the player of the game can apply the knowledge they learn, maybe from the training program, and apply the, and practice the tool they learn and resolve the incident in a fast manner. So usually, you need at least a game master to run the game. So the main responsibility for the game master is to prepare the game, to recreate the incident in a safe environment, and driving the conversation during the war game. And also, of course, you need a player. So depending on what simulation game you want to create, or like depends on the nature of the incident, it could uh, be only involve one player. For example, if you only focus, want to focus on the investigation part or the technical part of the simulation game, then you can only have one player who is doing the debugging and, uh, and the investigation. Um, if you want to practice more, like you want to practice your communication protocol or escalation protocol, you, have multi you can have multiple players there. Um, someone could be the communicator, someone could be the coordinator, and someone could investigate this issue. So for the next few slides, I'm gonna walk you through three steps to create a war game from scratch. So the first one is to pick a scenario. I'll give you a few ideas there. So you can create a war game based on a real pass instance. For example, if your website, your website may have seasonal traffic or sometimes it has unexpected traffic, right? Um, like back Black Friday, and maybe for Yelp we have the reservation um, service, and for us it's like Mother's Day, it's a big day. Um, so you could create some uh, war game based on your past instance happened during this unexpected traffic days, like holidays, or you could create a, like a more typical incident simulation game based on, for example, maybe some critical system crashes or databases crashes. Another way to create a war game is use your imagination. So just group people together and let them brainstorming and discussing about what about if certain component of your system crash? Does your system even, how does, it, how does your system react to that? Do you even get alert for that? If you do, how you, how you recover that? How you handle that? Who's the stakeholder? What may break? Um, just like brainstorming will like create a lot of value for new engineers as well. So after you decide, your scenario you want to run a war game on, the next thing is to find someone who is willing to pair this game and run this game. This might be the most difficult part of the war game running. But here's some help. We have a war game template. Um, later I will post a URL, you can download it from there. Um, so basically the first step to prepare a game is to set up the instance. So here we have two ways to set it up. The first one is the interactive. So you can choose a safe environment to set it, set it the incident. For example, um, you can create a war game in a staging environment or a non-production environment, or if you, uh, companies are globally, your service or are globally distributed, you probably can choose uh, other geo environment that doesn't have a high volume of traffic. Um, these are the safe environment. This is much more fun for the player, actually. They can just play around, they just like poke around. Um, but it does require a lot of time to prepare for the first time at least. Or a more low cost solution is to prepare it for the static, from the static way. So you already have a postmortem and it should contain a lot of details there. You have the dashboard, you have the screenshot, you have the logs. You can just present that as a static materials to your players. Um, it's less fun, they cannot play around. If they ask something you don't have, probably that's already a clue, so they know that's not a, something they can chase. Um, but it's like a low cost solution here. Once you decided how you're gonna set it up, you need to write it down. In the template, we already have a section. The main purpose here is the next time if someone else wants to rerun this war game, they don't need to build it from scratch. They can just reuse the step. So for example, if you choose to set up your war game in a more interactive way, so what you need to record here is how you trigger this alert in which environment. So record things like what are the input, what are the environment configurations you have, and what are the command to trigger this alert. 
after that, as a war, uh, as a war game, game game master, you need to specify how many players you want in this war game. As I said before, depending on the nature of the instance you are simulating, you could ask for like multiple players, each of them play different roles, uh, communicators, investigators. Um, if it's also okay, you can only have one player and they're gonna investigate this issue alone. Um, you may also want to give some checklist for the player because uh, you want to, them, uh, to have the minimum access to the environment that you set up the game so they can do the investigation themselves. Maybe you want to mimic the work from home situations or globally um, distributed team situations. You probably can ask them to uh, join the external Wi-Fi or set up or connect it through VPNs so, or, or ask them to communicate through a um, special channel. So these are the things you should write it down and make sure the player already uh, have all the things before joining the game. A lot of things to prepare. The last step to prepare the game is to prepare some hints. So sometimes, you know, players struggle in the game, right? And it's okay, it's the purpose. We want them to struggle. But if they stuck in a situation too long, you may want to give some hints. For example, you can ask them to go to some dashboard or have you ever asked the question like if you ever check this log? And um, that will like help the, uh, that will give some directions for the players. So that's the steps to prepare a game. And the last thing is actually make it happen, run the game. So here are some tips for running the game. So first, you can invite everybody in the team to join this war game. They don't have to play, not, not everybody have to play this game, but invite some audience in the team, uh, from the team into this meeting. People are not playing this game can also benefit a lot just by simply observing what other people's doing during the incident. Also, as a game master, ask clarified questions. So you want to make sure that your player understand the situation here and they understand the rationale behind of each of their decisions or actions. For example, you can ask them, why do you, what do you check that dashboard for? What do you think that data in that dashboard come from? Maybe you can ask them to list all the possibilities um, for this crash behind, um, the, all the possible reasons behind this crash and ask them why they think one may be the reason, one may be the not. Um, yeah, so the last note, uh, the last part is to take some note. So actually, Wargame is a very good place, can spot some flaws in your training program or in your documentations. So usually you find players stuck at some place because you don't have uh, good run books or this part of knowledge is not covered by your training program. Um, ask the game, that the game master or maybe someone else to take some notes so you have some follow-up items after the war game. So if you think, oh God, this is like a lot of work, um, the hardest part is probably I need to find someone who is willing to run this. You're right, it's gonna take a lot of time to run the war game and prepare a war game, at least for the first time. But you know, we're all engineers. Um, we tend to writing code to tackle this high human cost issue, right? So we have a low cost option for you, is to use tool to do this. So in our team, um, we choose Twine, which is uh, open source uh, tools that help you build a text adventure game, where we build uh, an on-call simulation text adventure game. So I have a GIF here, basically it shows you can set up the scene and give different options to the players based on what they choose. They may have different ending, either solve the case or not. Um, so with that, I'm gonna give you like a five minutes break. You can either go to this URL, play this on-call game and see if you like it and see if you can survive in this on-call game. <laughs> or you can go to this URL, it include um, the training materials we had, um, also contains the war game template. So yeah, we'll be back in five minutes. So the next part, I'm gonna talk about the runbooks. So if you want to improve your runbooks, be back.
Hi, so I'd like to present the survey result from the answer from you all. So if you remember the question still, this is the answer. So did you feel ready before going on call for the first time? And um, this room is actually doing pretty well. Um, better than Yelp. <laughs> so about 60% said no and 40% said yes. And if not, why didn't you feel ready? No onboarding, no training, was the only person. Let's see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a lot of knowledge, lack of knowledge, dependencies. Yeah, so I'll p post all the results in the GitHub repo later. And there's also the, what do you wish you knew before going on call? <laughs> <laughs> I would not read it out loud. <laughs> this is pretty funny. But yeah, it was also real. You are never alone. Yeah. It'll be okay. <laughs> like, it's good to know. Yeah, and then how long does it take for an engineer on your team to become part of Onco? It's, uh, yeah, I guess the bigger one is three to six months, which is the case for us as well. Um, and I guess it really depends on how large your organization is. So yeah, some organization can take a very long time and some are very fast. Do you have an on call training process? A lot of people don't. I'm surprised. Whoa. Okay, so yeah, you definitely should make an on call training process. Um, that's my recommendation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anything in structured learning curriculum, structured training, shadowing. Yes, shadowing is another thing that can be helpful in low cost documentation formalize it, live exercises. So that could be a war game. <laughs> okay, so thank you so much for responding. So this will all be uploaded, so if you want to take a look more slowly, you have a PDF. So yeah, let's get back into the presentation. Okay, does everyone win the game? <laughs> Did you survive in the game? Yes, I see some smiling face. Congratulations. Cool. Um, so the last part of today's workshop, we're gonna go through how you can build uh, effective runbooks, especially this is very important for new hires. So we're going back to this survey again. So we asked our organization why you didn't feel ready. So we found that almost 40% of people didn't feel ready due to the lack of protocol. And we also have a question in a survey, ask them what do they, what do they want to improve about their on-call training program. It's almost the same response we get here. More documentations, better documentations, update improved documentations and runbooks, clear um, protocols, and at 3 a.m. you need dump proof instructions. So we found that almost 70% of the people who said, they said like they will review the team's runbook before going on call. So what does this tell us, uh, tells us? It tells us like engineers want better and good documentations and runbooks. Why is that? Why do we care? Well, first of all, runbook will increase your instant response efficiency. It will reduce the mistake. It will reduce the time that people need to resolve the instance. Also, for someone who's never been on call, having a clear runbook will help them to reduce their nervousness. And last, sometimes runbook can uh, serve as a stand-in for a mentor or for a backup member. 
this would also reduce the toy that one single instance could take on the entire team. So before going through like what is Runbook, let me ask you the question. Who has Runbook for their on-call process or for their technical on-call process? Okay, cool. A lot of people has. Um, if you don't have, this is a perfect presentation for you. Um, who want to improve their on-call runbook? More hands? Yeah. Okay, cool. Then let's go through it. So what is the runbook? So we group the runbooks into two categories. The first one is technical runbook. And the second one is non-technical runbook. So technical runbook should be a step-by-step -step instructions of how you act in the instance. It could include um, impact assessment, mitigation steps, and if necessary, disaster uh, recovery um, plan. So it should be a quick guide, and you should use it during the instance. So in another word, it shouldn't be a deep dive of how your system is implemented. And in, for a metaphor, that it should be a guide of how to jumpstart your car, but not how to build your car. And for the non-technical runbook, um, you should specify the human process during your instance. Probably you could specify how many people you want or what the roles they're playing during the incident response, like communicators or commanders or investigators. And you also should specify how often you want to communicate or how, or what you want to communicate and how you want to escalation policy to be. So for the next few slides, I'm gonna walk you through a real life example of how to write a good technical runbook. And we, in the end, we'll briefly discuss what is non-technical runbook. So how we can write a good on-call runbook. So I'm gonna walk you through a real instance. It's a simplified version of a real instance. And there we can see some symptoms of bad runbooks. And I hopeful, uh, hopefully there it will give some ideas of how to write a good runbook. So there's gonna be a, uh, some slides with a lot of text. Uh, I will read it for you, but um, we'll also upload our slides to the URL there. Okay? So you've probably already seen these slides. I will use the same example um, as it's called Ad Analytics. So when a user on Yelp view an ad or click an ad, we lock them. We lock this user action. And during, like after midnight, we have a pipeline that will basically just join the logs, aggregate the data, and store the output into a data store. And this output is going to be used by the billing purpose and also going to be used by the targeting system to improve the ad's quality. So you can imagine there, this is a critical system, revenue critical system, right? So if the batch field for some reason is going to delay the process of billing. So the goal here for the on-call person, which is me, is to recover this batch as soon as possible. So here is my journey. So around 2 a.m., that's time we usually got a page. I got a page and I wake up and I see add analytics field. So my instinct here is like, oh, I need to recover it as soon as possible, right? So, but I don't know how. Um, how can I rerun this batch? Uh, is it safe to rerun? Is it unimportant? Uh, what is the exact command I need to use? So I search our internal wiki page and luckily I found one. It, it, it exists. So here is what I found. This is not the actual runbook. This is the table of content of that runbook. <laughs> And you can see there's a lot of stuff. It's 2 a.m. in the morning where I start. Now I'm feeling like this. Like, where is the tool? Where is the command I need? So I do a quick scan here. I found this section, alert. OK, I got alert. This may be relevant to me, right? So I click link, I go here. <laughs> to do, this section would benefit a lot from having our actual alert list and detailed here. Ha ha. Yeah, it's not helpful, right? So I go back. So I go back to the next section. It has exactly the same name, add analytics, as in my alert. So OK, this looks promising. And I'm going to fast forward a little bit. I, I did something else in the middle. But like eventually, I find this subsection called fix and retry the broken actions. OK, that's the, that's the part. Let's go for it. So those are the text also. It says, if a batch died due to an EMR, DB, or other intermittent issue, attempt to run the action manually. 
if the batch died due to the logic error, push the fix and run the action manually. Okay, it gave me two options here. Which one should I go? I have, I have no idea. I'm the first time being on call for this system. I'm new hire. I have no idea. But anyway, looks like I had to rerun this batch manually, right? Okay, how I do that? To run manually, read the command line printed in this output. It's between the node and the requirement lines. Where is this line? I, I don't know. I, I can't use my imagination here. Like, where, where, where should I get it? So, this is a uh, me looking at this documentation, um, not feeling very well. So I know this is a really uh, revenue critical system, so I don't want to mess things up. I don't want the next day my manager call me, so what do you do? So I call my secondary on call uh, because I need some help here. So I paged the secondary on call, very luckily, uh, the secondary got up pretty quickly, only after 10 minutes. So I asked the question, where can I find the run, rerun comment? Second, say you can try looking at it in the wiki. I just checked; it's not very clear. And the second says, "Oh, maybe it's in the Google Docs repo. Oh, I've got some notes in my home directory, and I think I saw some email about that a while ago." Oh, not very. <laughs> I mean, it is helpful, but not very straightforward, right? So, after almost one hour since I woke up, um, I did a lot of search, and then I did a lot of search in different people's home directory. And finally, I got this, <laughs> finally I got this command line. Um, and after some time, this batch recovered. So what make this runbook difficult to use? I think you're already um, feeling that, and hopefully that these, all this doesn't like, look similar or to your case. Okay, so the first thing is like there's an information overload. Um, these documentations kind of combine the deep dive of system implementations and to the operational instruction. So I can't map my action clearly enough to the sections I want to use. Also, there's no clear actional items. So in this runbook, it seems to give me some decision trees, right? It tell me if it's A, you should do X. If it's B, you should do Y. But it didn't really tell me like how I can tell which case is which, right? It doesn't have any clear actionable items there. And also, very ambiguous wording. So what does it mean to rerun an action manually? What is exactly an uh, action? This is very confusing for new hires because they don't have the vo vocabulary yet. Also, it's out of date, right? It has this to-do section. So, I don't know if I can trust this runbook because it hasn't been update, updated so long, right? And the last thing is like, it's very hard to find and search because all the content are spread out across, the, it's everywhere, it's all over the places. So what makes a good technical runbook? You should do the exactly opposite of all everything I listed there. So first, structure your runbook. Um, you should structure your runbook in the inverted pyramid where the most important or the most commonly used um, content should be on the top and not so relevant content should be at the bottom. Have a clear map between the alert name to the actionable items. It's gonna save you a lot of time in the middle of the night when you woke up and you see the alert name and you search and you go directly to the actionable items. Also include some actual command and screenshot. Um, you probably want to include the command that you can safely run in any environment. And it's very helpful if you can also include some output of that command. It's gonna save the new on-call engineers a lot of time too. Keep it up to date. The runbook should reflect how your system is currently working and it should be updated with any major change to your code. So, have a consistent format. Um, so this is very important because like once you have a consistent format across your organizations or across your team, across multiple runbooks, if, even if the run, even if the on-call person never seen this runbook before, they know which section to references. So here uh, we're uh, give you the. Um, 
template or the runbook template we're using in our team. So it has like a very clear map um, between the alert. It has a one sentence description below and what is the stoker, uh, st uh, stakeholder impact. And also we have some mitigation st steps below. So the most important aspect of this runbook is to make it a ru uh, alert based. So each alert has its own runbook. Um, so it will be very clear for the on-call engineers. Okay, so with that, um, so let's make your own runbook. So here we're gonna separate it to like three steps. Uh, the first step is to list all the alerts. Maybe that's a lot, but you could choose like a one topic in your system and list all the alerts for that. And then we can customize the uh, template. And then last one is to pick a home for a runbook. So we're gonna spend two minutes on this and think about maybe one system and list all the alerts that either doesn't have a runbook at all or maybe have a terrible runbook you want to improve. So we're gonna do, spend two minutes. Okay, um, we're running a little bit short of time here, so we're gonna um, maybe skip the rest of uh, the exercise here. But the point here is that you already have a list in your hand, and then you can take home and do the rest of the exercise, and that's gonna benefit the, your team. So, um, so the second step is to customize this template. So. Start with one alert in your list. It could be the most important one, or it could be the most um, high impact alert in your system. Or it, it could be an alert that doesn't have any runbook. So if you already have a runbook for that, good for you. Uh, you can just check that runbook. And remember these tips were just discussed, and see if you can make any improvement to your runbook. If you don't have a runbook before, Maybe you can reuse our template or maybe customize our template and see if it makes sense to your team. Um, we don't have two minutes for that, but hopefully you can go there and download this runbook and see if it works for you. The very last things you want to do is like you want to pick a home for your runbook. So you remember this? You remember my sad face of this? So. No matter how hard you try to improve your runbook, no matter how good your runbook is, if, you, if people can't find it, can't search it, it's useless, right? So here's a few tips you can make it easy to use and easy to find. So if your mitigation step is very short, maybe you can just embed it into your alert. If it's like long, maybe you can cut off a short link and link it in your alert. And also try to find a centralized home. 
you can choose to use like your internal wiki page or Google Docs repo or even command your runbooks with your code. Um, but whatever you change, pick one, make it centralized. And also, when you choose the um, home for your runbooks, make sure they are searchable. Um, so that like people can find it and use it. So with that, uh, we don't have a minute for that. So we're going to skip to the example of non-technical runbook. I'm going to um, do a little quick here. But I'm basically going to show you the runbook, the non-technical runbook we use at our team. So the URL is there. Feel free to download it. So basically, you have like five sections. The assessment, how you define an incident, how you run this, what is the conditions to trigger it, and what's the escalation policy there, who you should contact, who, how can you get help, and how you communicate with internal users or external users, and how you do investigate and fix, and how you clean up after the incident. So just do in one section. So communications. So in our team, we um, have a spe uh, special protocols around ticketing and what information you should include in your ticketing for internal communications. And also, we specify the uh, special channels for communication, live communications. And also, what should you include in your email notifications to external users or to internal users. So these are the uh, checklist for um, the incident response process we have at our team. So with that, um, I hope you have a good time at this workshop. So what we've been discussed in this workshop. So you can start like making your new on-call engineer feel more comfortable about on-call by setting up an on-call training program. So there, you could set up the right expectations for them and create an on-call training program by Try to avoid the information overload and use the visual aid and try to focus more on the tools in your training. Beyond training, there's also many other ways to share the incident related knowledge with them. You can invite it to the team meetings or uh, share the postmortem with them, run the war game for them. And also, uh, effective runbooks will make a uh, new on-call engineer happier. So with all that, I hope uh, through this workshop, um, you can take something back to work and build it from there to have a productive and happy new on-call engineer ever after. Cool. The training material is here and will be around if you have any questions. Okay, here's some references and thank you.